um, remind everybody the May, our last meeting for this season is going to be May, and it's going to be the first Monday in May, and it's Lisa Bartlett from the Orange County Supervisor, of course, and she's going to have many up updates on the county for us, I'm sure. So please mark your calendar for the first Monday in May for Lisa Bartlett. May and, 3rd. Huh? May 3rd. It's May 3rd. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so, so I want to thank everybody who has responded to the emails and the feelings that we sent asking you to renew your memberships. It's very important because in May, we have the Board of Directors elections coming up. So if you or another LCC member you know wants to volunteer to serve on our board, please email me. It is for a one-year term. It pays zero dollars, but you will be helping <laughs> continue the mission of preserving Laguna Canyon, open space, and our other environmental issues that we do like to weigh in on. So please watch for more emails from the LCC about board elections. Only paid members can vote or serve on the board, but please think about joining and helping us out. So let me just tell everybody a little bit about tonight's program. Uh, Norm Grossman, of course, is very graciously accepted our invitation to be our speaker. He is the current president of Laguna Greenbelt, which was founded by Jim Dilley in 1968 and is a grassroots organization significantly responsible for saving the 22,000 acre coastal wilderness open space. There is a critical need to improve the wildlife corridor connecting the Santa Ana Mountains to the coastal wilderness that will allow species to improve their genetic health. So let me tell you a little bit about Norm if you don't know already. So, Norm Grossman has been involved with planning and development issues in Laguna Beach since moving here in 1978. He has served on the Laguna Beach Planning Commission from 1988 to 2000, and again from 2001 to 2015. So prior to that, he served on the Design Review Board from 1984 to 1986. He has stayed involved in city planning issues as a board member of the Laguna Greenbelt and the Laguna Beach Beautification Council. His professional background includes 25 years as an electrical design engineer and manager in the aerospace industry and 20 years as a college professor and administrator. Norm, you look so young, how can that be? So, so Norm is going to start his presentation and without further ado, Norm, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Norm, unmute you, yourself. Thank you, Gene. That would help. It's hard to make a presentation being muted. And yeah, thank you. I, uh, I muted everybody, you know. Gotcha. Okay. So, uh, as said, this is going to be a brief discussion of the Laguna Greenbelt, which had, was mentioned has been in existence now for 53 years. Very brief history, because as we just discussed in the beginning, I'm sure a lot of people have seen the film that uh, Ron did with Harry Huggins and Bob Orthwick worked on and went into a lot of detail on stuff. And that, again, you can get some more information from those. I'm gonna cover a few other little areas that are not touched upon. I'll go into the current projects the Greenbelt's working on and then finish with projects in the near future. And then we'll go into the questions and answers. So as mentioned, the Greenbelt started in 68, um, started as the Citizens for the Greenbelt, founded by Jim Dilley. And th there is the sculpture of uh, Mr. Dilley that was done and hung earlier this year at the community center. This was done by Marv Johnson with help from Bill Atkins. And there's another one, not a just a straight proclamation, well, it's a scroll type of a, 
of a item that's at the Canyon Club and we're looking at putting others within the city. So the Laguna Greenbelt itself was incorporated in 1970. This was, it's hard to find a map of what the Greenbelt was envisioned as. This is about the best that we have found. Um, and as you can see, it's difficult to really figure out what's going on, but conceptually you can see the El Toro Y and have a vague idea of the idea of surrounding the city of Laguna Beach with open space, the idea of a Greenbelt that Jim Dilley had. And in starting the green belt, the idea was to preserve the surrounding area and to try to get public and government support of the concept. And that was probably the most important part is selling people on the idea. This is an attempt to show what that looks like today. What you see is I've tried to take that original kind of rough drawing and put it onto a map of what exists today. So that's what we've got here. Let me just, excuse me a second. How do I, that'll do it. Okay, so this is showing how much open space has been saved since the original idea. And it's approximately twice as much. Now, the important point to remember here is how we got this much. And the key element here is it's a variety of different methods involving citizens getting involved from multiple communities. We tend to think, as our names imply, of being Laguna Beach centric on some of this acquisition. But a lot of it occurs through efforts of groups like ours that are within the county. And this shows in a way how this all occurred. Uh, number one was the state purchasing Crystal Cove. And at the time, the state spent something I think in the order of $30 million to buy that. And that was considered outrageous by some people. So you know, that was the first goal. And that was again by lobbying from people, citizenry uh, to say to the state, this is land worth saving. The second, the Bomber Shady Canyon open space was the result of citizens in Irvine trying to make sure that Quail Hill and other areas were not developed. And they had a ballot measure put on in which they pretty heavily supported that idea. And, you know, as an example of what this meant was the Irvine Company's original plans for some of the development had a road that actually extended Sand Canyon from the freeway all the way to Coast Highway. And you can imagine what would have happened and what that would have done to the wildlife that we're going to be talking about and fragmenting if that had gone through. Three is the thing we're all familiar with, the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park. But this in itself also consists of two different parts. The part north of the toll road is what we tend to think of as the result of the Save the Canyon efforts. This was the land that we purchased from the Irvine Company. I'll get back to that in a second. But below that is land that was the result of efforts by the, at the time, Friends of the Irvine Coast to pressure the Irvine Company into dedicating land in order to do development of the Newport Coast. Uh, group later changed their name to Friends of the Newport Coast, but they were involved in very heavy negotiations with support of multiple environmental groups throughout the South County, including Laguna Greenbelt. The Canyon Purchase, of course, was the result of a multi-year effort. Uh, everybody remembers the walk done in uh, 1990, but I think what's been forgotten is how much support that effort had from environmental groups throughout the county. Now, one of the things was a presentation by different groups throughout the county to support the idea because the thought was, well, maybe we can galvanize different areas and start saving open space throughout Orange County. This was at a time where we 
1988, he had attempted to put a slow growth initiative on the ballot that failed because of massive spending by various developers. And this was an attempt to get these groups back involved. And in fact, after the walk, when the Irvine Company agreed to enter into negotiations on purchase or selling the land, that started out as a countywide effort. The original negotiations included groups from all over the county to see if we could do a county ballot measure and save land in multiple areas. We, unfortunately, the polling on that showed that there was only one area that would support a tax measure to save open space, and that, of course, was Laguna Beach. And so that effort basically was restricted down to just dealing with the city of Laguna Beach. And of course, uh, everybody knows the result of that and the massive support of uh, the public showed an 80% approval on the bond measure. The Jim Dilley Preserve was an effort. This was before that, this was in the late seventies. This was the uh, attempt to keep development of that portion of the canyon from happening, uh, that the city then purchased that land in order to preserve it. Five is Alta Laguna Park, which I think everybody's familiar with. Again, a city purchase and a result of a development proposal that uh, the city then was able to buy off the land and create the park. Six, uh, Aliso Wood Canyon is the result of the development of Aliso Viejo and came about because the county decided to double the density, not the density, double the number of houses allowed from 10,000 to 20,000 and in return to save approximately half the land as open space. So the thing to remember here is just how many people are involved and government agencies too, that part of this is getting the public involved and the public then driving the political efforts to save this land. Because without all this, uh, none of this happens. And you're looking at spending from people and the different cities, state, government's also involved in this and the county. You know, the county has spent a considerable amount of money. In fact, the Laguna Canyon purchase, the negotiations really were kicked off by the county uh, promising to donate $10 million into the initial purchase. This is something that I know was discussed when uh, Hallie talked to you a couple months ago, and that's this idea of preserving open space in Laguna Beach. This happened in 1998, when the Greenbelt sponsored an initiative that would say the land that has been purchased by the city for open space needs to have some guarantee that it'll remain open space. And so the initiative changed both uh, the general plan and the city zoning ordinance to create permanent open space zones. And what these did is said, any time you change the zoning on these areas. If the city wants to zone for development of any kind, it would need a vote of the people. This does expire, and the reason it expires is because state requirements on general plans is they have to be reevaluated on a fairly regular basis, generally within 20 years. We push it a little to make it 30 years, but a city really should keep its general plan updated. And I'm gonna come back to this in a later slide on a slightly different issue. Oops. Okay, this is something else that the Green Belt sponsored. And that was working with, as you can see, the groups on the bottom right-hand corner of the World Wildlife Fund and the Nature Conservancy to create brochures to submit to send out to people, basically starting in Laguna, but it's been used in other areas. And it's those people living on wildlife interfaces where houses come up against open space and telling people, as you can see by the titles, living lightly on the edge, make sure that the open space stays open, that you're not putting stuff in it that's gonna cause problems. Uh, living with wildlife, what are some things you do to minimize the impact you're having on wildlife and the impact they may have on you. And same with uh, what can you plant that will work with birds and again, try to enhance the whole idea of living in this area and what you can bring to it. This is something that needs updating 
And we'll, again, later on when I get into some of the future things we're doing and things we're doing right now, I'll come back to this. But this is all showing you in the past because then you can understand the present and future. Okay, this is the wildlife corridor. And I know a lot of you saw the Greenbelt Annual Meeting in which uh, we, we talked about the wildlife corridor in a lot of detail and in fact showed a video of the wildlife corridor. And I'm gonna touch on a couple other things right now just to reinforce because I've had a couple questions from people about some aspects of it. And basically what we have is 22,000 acres of open space, but it's an island. And it's an island because the animals in and the plants in the op that open space are not connected, <coughs> excuse me, with other open spaces. And what this leads to is a couple things. One of the main ones is this loss of genetic variation or genetic drift is another term that's used. And this is a little drawing showing uh, how that affects a cheetah population because the paper I took this for was on cheetahs. And basically with multiple mates or, and multiple mates don't have to be for one, off, one set of offsprings, but it could be multiple times that the female is mating. But you get genetic variation within the cubs. And what happens then is a disease that may occur may not affect all of them. Whereas if it's a single mate, then you have low variability and a certain type of disease can wipe them all out. This is like in plants a monoculture where you create a plant that is identical and a single disease can wipe it out. And right now, that's why people are predicting the end of the, bana the banana as we know it within 10 years, because there is a fungus that's killing all of them. And since bananas are cloned and not planted, you know, that's a problem. And the same thing occurs with animals. And not only does it, it, this occur, but the other problem with this island idea is uh, the idea of what happens in case of any type of a disaster, that the animals are trapped. So a major fire, for example, the animals have no place to go. So that's one of the things we have to really worry about is in this needs for a wildlife corridor that we're trying to connect fragmented spaces, have more genetic mixing of the animals, which gives you biodiversity and allows the wildlife to flee from fires. You know, I had a question at the last meeting, at the, the annual meeting, where target species were shown and coyotes were put on the list as something that was potentially at risk and somebody going, well, why do we have to preserve coyotes? And that gets into this thing of alpha species and coyotes control a lot of smaller animals that you are not very popular, such as rats and other types. And it's part of the whole ecosystem. You take out the coyotes and then you'll have the smaller animals and probably ones you don't want propagating. So the idea of the corridor, and th this has been shown several times, is just to create a pathway. We have the Santa Monica Mountains, which are an immense open space, and we have our 22,000 acres, and we need a way to get from the mountains to the coast. You know, one of the names that was tossed around for a while was the Mountains to Coast Wildlife Corridor. We eventually settled down the Irvine Laguna Wildlife Corridor, since the, most of the corridor, if not all of it, re resides within the Irvine boundary. This is a top view of trying to show you where uh, the corridor is going. Starting out in the very north end, north is to the right, unfortunately, in this drawing, uh, which this is property that it was all part of the El Toro um, Air Force Base. And the, this was the area of the El Toro Base, about a thousand acres that nobody wanted. So when the 4,700 acres of El Toro was offered for anybody who wanted to take it, 
starting with federal agencies, because this area required cleanup, it had been used for ordinance testing. So nobody really wanted to get into it. Uh, but the FBI took a portion of it. So th that's the property. Then we get into the Great Park, which is Irvine took the property and then uh, created the Great Park, which now is being done by Five Point uh, developer. So that's this whole area that is north of the Five Freeway. Then south of the Five Freeway, uh, you get into the Irvine Spectrum area and uh, a lot of development. And then finally down at the bottom part of this, what's called Remnant Reach, you get creeks where the animals can go. And so what we're trying to do is take creek paths that the animals will use on both ends and then create a connection between those two. So this remnant reach is paths the animals are using, kind of trying to use, using with some success. The so-called planned reach is a developed reach, which Five Point is doing. We have severe problems at several points and I'll show a slide next showing where those points are. But this is an example of what happens at the real problem point, which is near the five freeway or under the five freeway. And that's, you can see here, you've got human presence. Animals don't like to be where humans are. We've got all kinds of data telling us that. We have standing water at times. We've got debris, we have lack of vegetation. We have lack of fencing, which means, unfortunately, you have both, in this case, obviously, taggers and homeless trying to find shelter. And all of that keeps the animals out. So this creates areas that are called pinch points, where generally these are underpasses, where the animals are being discouraged from going through. And there's a couple of ways we found these. In 2018, uh, the Laguna Greenbelt did a camera study. And again, that if, that's been presented a couple of times. We have videos on our website of all this stuff in detail, if you really want to get into it. And that camera study, along with the previous one, identified where animals were going and where they were not going. And this shows the areas. This, by the way, this underpass here is right by the Irvine Auto Center and the CarMax site, in fact, is right before it to give you an idea of where we are. But as you can see, it's something like 1,200 feet long and animals are very reluctant to go through that. But we have other problems and we're going to talk about this Bacon Lake Forest one briefly. Um, this just shows what we're going to try to do to solve the problem. This is a attempt to say, okay, we need to identify exactly what's going on. That camera study was a start. The Greenbelt has formed a group of science advisors, which are people who work on this a lot uh, all over the state uh, for different agencies, for different uh, companies, and can really look at this, see what has worked in the past and what hasn't worked. So what we're doing is getting these people together to suggest studies, to suggest what we can do to solve the problem. And then once we have this, sorry, I will pick, sorry. And then once we have decided on possible solutions, seek funding, implement those solutions, and then it's kind of a feedback. Did they work? Did they not work? Do we need to keep changing it? So this is what we're going to be doing in the near future. This is our plan right now going forward, hopefully within the next several months. As I mentioned, this is Bacon Lake Forest. This is an underpass that we expect animals to use. And the problem, there's multiple problems here. There's all this riprap down at the bottom that some animals are not going to use. There's a lack of vegetation and animals don't like to be out on the open. The small ones do not because obviously they're concerned about predators. Uh, there's no fencing to keep humans from doing whatever they want around here. So we're gonna look into adding the fencing, adding vegetation, creating some additional pathways 
and trying to educate people. So the people who live near there, you're living next to a really important connection that will help our wildlife. Let them know that, let them know what they can do to help, let them know what they can avoid doing, such as bringing, you know, walking their dogs through here and other things. So, you know, that's gonna be an important part of this. I mentioned before those brochures that Greenbelt had produced. This is something we're looking into and working with our science advisors. And that is creating standards for what's now called a wildlife urban interface. This is something now that's getting a lot of play in WUI. Right now it's all on wildfire safety. So right now all the emphasis is on, you know, how do you make a house that's adjacent to open space or wildland fire safe. What's not looked into are building standards. And Audubon has done this. This is a brochure that I think was from San Francisco where you set standards for how you create a bird safe environment. You know, this identifies the type of glass you use so birds don't fly into it and other features. And we need to do the same for wildlife. And so that is gonna be one of the efforts we're gonna get our science advisors involved in. And those include, as it says here, things like how much noise you make, the lighting you use, because lighting will scare off animals, how you mix public use with animal pathways. So that's one of the things we'll be doing, again, in the near future, along with the situation of just trying to, to fix the problems we have right now with the corridor. Okay, if you want more information on the corridor, uh, here's the two websites. The Laguna Greenbelt website covers, tries to cover everything we're doing, all these different efforts. The Wildlife Corridor is focused on just that. And right now on the Wildlife Corridor is the video of our annual meeting, which gives you a lot more information on this corridor. And uh, that will soon be on the Laguna Greenbelt one. So if you need more information, that's where to find it. All right, this is an issue that obviously Jean mentioned before, you have of a top of the world, and that's this overuse of parks and open space. Now, although this has become a really hot issue recently, locally, it's been a national problem for at least four years. And that's why I threw up this thing about from September of 2017, that national parks have been overrun with people. And so the question is, well, gee, what do we do about this? And there's a number of possible solutions. Um, you know, we can try to set limits on people going off trail, particularly bikers. We can set limits on nighttime activities. We can set limits uh, on when people can use it. But along with limits, we need to enforce those. It's one thing to put up a sign, it's another thing to make that sign work. I think it's important, the last two indented bullets, to try to get the different user groups involved. You know, we have some preliminary information on that in our parks in Orange County right now, two thirds of the people using those parks are using it to enjoy the park experience. And one third are in it for active recreation. And those are different user groups. And so they may require obviously different areas. And we need to look into that. We need to educate people on what proper protocol is. And most importantly, we need funding. Now the city has stepped up, we're gonna be stepped up recently and in increasing some funding to let uh, we're gonna Kenya Foundation docents help in the area top of the world. But we need this to be a more serious effort by all the cities around us, the county, the state, and the federal government to make sure that potential solutions are properly funded. People want parks. I mean, this, here's the good news. The good news is, and this has been shown now over and over again, people want the experience. They want to be in the open space. They want to be walking around. They want that feeling. So it's one of those things that should be funded. And we will be working you know, on that. Okay, a related issue, and I'll thank you know, 
this is something Penny Milne from Can Do has brought to our attention is the whole situation with Laguna Canyon Creek. And uh, there is a section on the Greenbelt website. Uh, Bob Borthwick, one of our board members, worked a couple of years ago and developed a remediation plan that included, uh, as you see, getting rid of some of the invasive plants, planting more trees, some creek trails, uh, improving fencing, just to really make the, the creek more attractive, take it more back to nature. And this is something that we need to keep looking at. And in fact, I'm gonna come back to this and get in what we're gonna be doing in the near future. Something to be aware of, and that's the city is right now looking into a state mandated housing element. State mandates, you have to do a new housing element every eight years. The number of houses you have to add is set by Southern California Association of Governments for our area, SCAG, and they have mandated in that in the next eight years that we're going to be should add, I think it's 393 new units. And so the question is, how do we add those? Now, I know there's a meeting tomorrow at three City Council and Planning Commission to discuss this, but the question that we're interested in is how do we protect open space areas, not zoned for open space. There are areas in particularly Laguna Canyon in which because after the city purchased the land, they were left at their current zoning, which is not open space. And so it's something that we need to keep aware of and keep involved in this process of making sure that our open space stays as open space. It's not saying that we don't want affordable housing or additional housing, it's we want it in the proper places. That said, the place to really do this is the Laguna Beach open space element, general plan open space elements. Okay, state requires mandatory elements in the general plan. The general plan is roughly described as the city's constitution. And the open space conservation element is a mandatory element. The state says you must have one. The state also says, I mentioned before that the open space initiative was only for 30 years because the state generally says your open space, your elements should be updated roughly every 20 years. Well, the open space element was adopted in 1984 and it was last updated in 2006. And you see all those updates, those are minor updates. This is something that's badly out of date. And for a city that takes pride in protecting and saving open space, this is unconscionable that we've let it go this long. So the current plan, in fact, here's another problem. This is an interesting one. If you go to the city's website and download the open space element, you'll get a previous version. You will not get the one I'm showing here. You'll get the one adopted in 1984. So we have a real problem here. So we'll be working to try to see some action on this. Here's a good example of the kind of problem we face. Uh, the city GIS map, this is showing high value habitat. And you can see in this area under uh, the El Toro, Laguna Canyon Y, uh, that there's a lot of it. And yet you look in the open space element and you see a blank page. And it's just, there's just no excuse for that. The other thing, and again, this is something I'll credit Penny with, is there is great uncertainty in what the setback from Laguna Canyon Creek should be. This has come up with lawsuits and other issues. And the problem is, and this is another problem we have to be aware of, the open space element talks about channelized and not channelized portions of the creek, but never defines what channelized means. So it's one of those things where, unfortunately, without a good definition, uh, you can have projects that you really shouldn't be having that don't properly respect the creek. This is something, again, uh, that we need to be involved with in the future. 
Similar situation, I mentioned the rezoning of Laguna Canyon. What I've shown here is a property uh, right above, I don't think, yeah, it's above Laguna Canyon and it's off uh, Mystic Hills and it's owned by the city and it's zoned RHP, which is residential hillside protection, which is basically three units per acre. So right now, this property can be developed. It's not under the open space in, initiative because it's not open space, even though the city owns it. So this idea of the properties that have been purchased and not been rezoned needs to be addressed. Hence, the need for a new open space initiative. We have some time on this, I'm hoping, because it doesn't expire, as you see, for another seven years. But what we need to do is start looking at it and start figuring out what we want to do to, to strengthen it. And for example, rezoning Laguna Canyon is one thing that's fairly easy to do. But I think what we really need to do is also say anytime the city buys new open space for open space, the city has to rezone it and put it under the same protection that we have. So this is something in a couple of years we'll really get into. We'll probably need again to uh, write an initiative and collect signatures and present it to the city council. Last time they just voted unanimously to accept it. We can't know in the future if that's gonna be the case. We may need another vote of the people. And boy, that is a rapid <laughs> uh, discussion of where we've been, where we're going, what's going on right now. So I will get rid of this thing and open it back up. Thank you, Nora. And take a that deep was, breath. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Do you need to take a drink of something <laughs> before we hit you with questions? Just a reminder, everybody, if you have questions for Norm, if you'll put them in chat, Jean will be happy to share them with us. So I'm going to ask the first question and not everything is pertaining exactly to your slides. As you know, we have broad concerns about the canyon. So one of our participants submitted a question about parking occupancy growing at four points five percent and the canyon road traffic growing at 13.5 percent i guess that's a caltrans figure what mitigations will lcc and perhaps laguna greenbelt take to manage the tsunami of new visitors visiting laguna beach by car at that growth we will have rates of our six million visitors will double to 12 by the year 2031 so, and this person does not want another parking management plan to make consulting. So I think the question is, these new visitors coming to Laguna Beach, you know, just growing and growing, what do you think we should do about that? I'll answer this from the Greenbelt perspective. Not my own, because I have my own ideas on this. But from a green Pub perspective, our, our position is fairly clear. We'll oppose any widening of Laguna Canyon Road that impacts open space. And that's been our position from the start that we will oppose any widening because to widen it, you're gonna to have to go into the open space and rezone it and we'll oppose any efforts. We will support any efforts to manage visitors in the parks and open space. So anything that'll help us take care of that, you know, we, we will work towards that goal is if that means, you know, directing people, adding more docents, et cetera, that will be our support. You know, as for people going shopping in the downtown, that's not our issue, you know, so. Great, well, thank you. Yeah. So, all right, regarding the genetic health of the wildlife, who to be healthy really need to interbreed with wildlife from the Cleveland National Forest. Do we really think it is a very dire situation? And is the Laguna Greenbelt considering any lawsuits to ensure an effective animal corridor under the five and 405 freeways? Can you say the last part I got any lawsuits to ensure? Are, is the Laguna Greenbelt considering any lawsuits to ensure an effective animal corridor? corridor? 
under the 405 and the five freeways. Perhaps you don't want to comment on lawsuits. <laughs> now, right now, our efforts are to find solutions. And right now, the question is, what is keeping animals from using the corridor? We know from our camera study that no large animal is going under the five freeway. In fact, it's hard to find any animal going under the five freeway. Uh, we're hoping, again, we'll, we're working up to something. We'll start with, as I said, the first effort is gonna be at Bake and Lake Forest to see if that works. And then hopefully seeing what works, we can move forward. Things like increasing lighting and putting in what are called animal shells. So the smaller animals can walk above the water. So, but right now, since that, if you, that map that showed the two and a half miles of the planned portion, that is five point and they are doing, they have dedicated that land 600 feet wide for as an animal corridor. And they've done the plantings and the underpasses and everything else that are animal friendly. So the problem we have right now is on our side of the five freeway and making sure that we can get those underpasses to work. And that's all developed right now. There's nobody to sue. Well, Norm, I would, this is Terry Watt. I would just add, um, you know, unfortunately the non-functional more than a mile long under crossing on the I-5 was approved by the agencies and that was part of Irvine Company Spectrum Permits. That's not to say we're not always watching for an opportunity to apply leverage, but right now the leverage we're applying is diplomacy. We're showing that it doesn't work and we're evaluating as Elizabeth would say if she's on uh, easier ways to make that undercrossing potentially functional knowing that it probably isn't, and we're going to need something, a bigger idea. So, but Norm's absolutely right. We're focused on the Laguna side of the I-5 at the moment uh, to test some really pretty simple fixes there. Uh, and then we'll turn back our attention to the, to the undercrossing. Great. Well, we all look forward to a connected corridor that works, right? <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay, so um, some of these questions jump around a little bit, but um, I'll just read them in order of what I have here. Okay, perhaps thanks to COVID-19, visitors are way up in the wilderness parks. The Aliso and Wood Canyons Wilderness Park has 30,000 visitors per month double from a few years ago, so 360,000 visitors a year. For the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park, a typical month was about 10,000 and is now about 40,000 visitors, with an estimated 75% being first-time visitors. Are the wilderness parks being loved to death, in your opinion? Mary, do you want to take this? Mary Fagris. Yes. Um, how do I say it nicely? Today I was a tide pool docent at Crystal Cove State Park, first time since February of 2020. The crowds were unbelievable. And that's the way it's been, particularly the last year. Um, it's very hard. You know, parks are formed for people be to come and enjoy. So there's this fine line all the time of having nature for folks to enjoy. Thankfully today, I was able to do a lot of education in the tide pool and the little kids with their buckets. I made sure <laughs> nothing left the, the ocean, but you know, because of the past year, we couldn't do the education. So we've really lost an opportunity to educate so many new park visitors. And hopefully soon, you know, volunteers will be able to be on the trails again and nature centers will be open and more education will happen for those folks. And, you know, many times, once you explain to people why you stay on the trail, why you don't take your dog out on a wilderness trail, 
why you go off trail. They understand it, but they do need to be told. Um, I, sometimes I just personally wish we were back in the old days when Laguna Coast Wilderness Park was open so many weekends out of the month and we let the park be there for the animals the rest of the time. I don't think the managing agencies, either state or county, will ever go along with anything like that. So education is going to be our key to manage the... I mean, there were people today at Crystal Cove State Park from Utah, from other inland states. I had someone from Iowa, <laughs> you know. So this is just an area people come to and we're just going to have to really work on the education level. Thank you. So Mary, the only thing I'd add is that um, it is becoming extremely common and we witnessed it yesterday in the San Francisco Presidio to literally close off access where there are, right now there are coyotes popping and so there are portions of the park that people completely accept, great signage, great docents talking about it that are closed from here for many, many, actually many months. Same thing with the beaches. Wow. And so Mary, I think it's an active dialogue right now because we are loving all of our open space in California to death. Mm -hmm. It's a very open dialogue by man land managers um, unfortunately, I'm going to say that we have more, I'm going to say, um, more progress has been made by national, um, mm -hmm. federal agency land managers uh, whose rules are more accepted by the public and who have rangers to enforce than some of the local parks agencies. But I predict that's going to change. Okay, well, what is going to have to happen here is the city of Laguna Beach is going to have to start to say more about what happens at Laguna Coast Wilderness Park. They are landowners, major landowner for that park. And the only way OC parks will change is if they get some pressure from the landowners, both Laguna Beach and Laguna Woods. So that's very important and we have our Coastal Greenbelt Authority which represents the landowners and you, the environmental organizations, and I'm very proud to represent all of you on that authority. Uh, and we're going to have to be strong in the future about that. Thank you. So um, I'm going to read this next question. It's actually probably a more of a comment and it ties in with what we just said and also next month when we have Lisa Bartlett here I'm sure we can involve her so on March 9th 2021 so just last month Mayor Bob Whalen wrote a letter to Supervisor Lisa Bartlett that included the city is currently developing a program to address neighborhood impacts by adding enforcement officers and sanitation workers but we need the county's assistance in adding park rangers to this area and along West Ridge Trail. I'm hoping you are able to work with the County Board of Supervisors and staff in increasing park rangers to monitor this area and address the quality of life issues and I'm sure the open space. I, and would everybody agree we need to more pressure on Orange County to assist? The city? Not just not just the county, as that one slide said, it has to be the county, the state, and even the federal government. It can't be just the county. And actually now may be a good time for it because the county and cities are gonna have extra funds right now. So, you know, I think it is very important at this point to really make that. And we may be, the Board of Supervisors may be more inclined these days. There has been a change on that. And so we're, you know, we are exploring that. We will certainly, as the Green Belt, uh, be putting as much pressure as we can on the county. And we are with several other groups involved in state efforts. You know, and the state is moving into this very heavily too. And Great. another thing to remember, I, it, the city of Irvine res restricts the, oh, their open space. It's not open every day. 
So we can use the city of Irvine more, I think, to help us achieve our goals here. Okay, all right, well, there's some questions that were posed that some, some of them are probably answered in the show, the pre presentation. So um, let's go to the Laguna Creek for a second. Regarding the building setbacks from Laguna Creek, is it your understanding, are they to be 25 feet from the edge of the creek, not the center of the creek? Depends okay. on the definition of channelized. Well, we don't have the definition. So what you that's do you the think? problem? Yes, oh. that's the problem. Right now, there are two different standards. And we didn't define what channelized means. What should be done, obviously, is we either uh, get rid of that term and get rid of that entirely and require 25 feet flat. We try to define it. What should be done is a survey of the entire creek length to determine where it should be 25 feet from the center 25 feet from uh, the edge based on environmental concerns. That's what we need is a brand new survey. In fact, this whole land use thing, getting back to that and the city's GIS maps, we need to do biological surveys again. We haven't done those in years. So this definition of high habitat, high value habitat needs to be updated. The, you know, the city is gonna do a update to the land use cell, uh, the open space element. Uh, it's going to cost some money in, in consultants to really update this stuff. We're using some data from the mid 90s and earlier. You know, you ask, where does this come from? And people, oh, it's the Carlin Marsh study that was done in, you know, 86 or whatever. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of the data is when somebody wants to develop something, we require for either an EIR or a negative depth then to do these studies, and that gets cranked in. But a full study of the city of what is high value habitat, what isn't, what are creeks, what, what should be uh, once that require setbacks, we're woefully out of date on all that information. So you're hopefully open space element uh, updating will address these or it, are we gonna be should. years and years <laughs> waiting? It should, but it's gonna cost, it's gonna cost money. I mean, the, the city has to make this a priority. And so they have to be willing to spend whatever money and also not fall for the, we don't have the manpower to do it. You know, great, we can hire consultants and we have enough expertise on the screen to do it with minimal help from, you know, just give us somebody to be a secretary, take notes and we can do the rest of it with everybody here. So yeah, it, it's something that really, when you get more into it, you're going, this is a city that prides itself on protection of open space. And yet the- They're behind the times. <laughs> is wildly obsolete. Yeah. Oh, we walked in the canyon in 1989, remember? 1989. Yeah. So <laughs> oh, those you're, of you are right. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay. 1990 was the Bond Act, yes. Right, right. Yes. So, okay. At the recent city council retreat, it was mentioned that the Laguna Canyon Road lots currently zoned light industrial M1A and M1B should be rezoned to allow housing. So you addressed that the zoning needs to be updated and clarified. So how could perhaps we assist with that? We have sent letters. We have sent letters to the city supporting you know, zoning, rezoning those to open space. What else can we do? Again, as far as rezoning land, the city purchases open space, it's open space, strong green position. As far as rezoning the M1A, M1B, it's not a green belt position. Again, I can offer my personal, but it's not a green belt one. Uh, that's something that, again, the uh, can do, you know, as a lead group on that and what should be done. And I mean, I've worked with them as an individual, but again, the Greenbelt's concern is open space, preserving open space, uh, not whether we're going to rezone an industrial property to be a housing property. The creek right. is mean, different, unless it's in, in unless there's endangered habitat around it. You know, we're for enforcing those rules. That's why 
the idea of mapping everything is so important. We'll support that whole effort. Well, so one of the questions, there are two lots near the intersection of Canyon Acres Drive and Laguna Canyon Road currently zoned for a duplex each. If there were efforts to significantly upzone these properties to allow many housing units, would the Laguna Greenbelt get involved? That, you're talking about the old Phillips property? I think that's where they had like houses, you know, they had- that. We're talking the old Phillips property? Is that Gene? Yeah. Uh, this is at the end of Canyon Acres Drive, the Mo Honaker property. Currently Mo Honaker property. Well, we don't know who owns it right now. Well, the bank, maybe. <laughs> Might be the bank. <laughs> no, it's not, you know, it's not in our mission statement. Okay. Individuals, yes. But, but not a green belt. Well, that I have a question then. What do you think of Laguna Greenbelt joining in a coalition with other environmental groups like Can Do, Laguna Canyon Conservancy, and you know, to maybe have strength in numbers when it comes to these questions and issues? And, and we have in fact, Jane, Penny, Hallie, and I were on a conversation two months ago uh, with city staff when the original housing element said, let's put houses at the Big Bend property. Yes. Yeah. Great. So, I mean, obviously on some of these issues, same thing with the Creek. You know, uh, Penny, Hallie and I were on a conversation recently to discuss uh, just the channelization issue. Yes, I'm all for the organizations working together. As I said, you know, it's something that on these issues of where there's a common overlap, it's very important we do that. You know, all of us, we have limited amount of people. Foundation at least has, uh, they can hire people at least, none of us can. Uh, so, you know, our times are, are limited. The more we can work together on these issues and spread the work out, and the more expertise we can bring in. You know, because we have the people who have been involved with this a long time. You know, that's, that's the blessing and the curse is, you know, you look at the screen and try to find anybody under 50. Uh, we have experience. Well, <laughs> but, yeah. well, along those lines, like, and this was our board member, Jackie Gallagher, you know, if we had a coalition and we have these, we want to reach out, get new people involved, we could have a booth at the sawdust or the farmer's market that offers our information. You know, we could all, you know, spread out and, you know, take different turns to man the booth and maybe, you know, get some involvement from people that have no clue about what we all do behind the scenes. Definitely. So that there might be is, something we could pursue. There is so much confusion about which group does what. Right. Well, how are you different than that group? Well, what's this group do? You know, and I think we all have very common goals with different specializations. And I think that's fairly easy to identify and make clear to people. And I don't know if, you know, some of these, obviously some of the stuff I said working in the future, uh, redoing the open space element is to me, every group in town should be involved with that has anything in it. Uh, seeking funding for some of this stuff, like protecting the parks, everybody should be involved in that. You know, so I think we can find a lot of common ground and work uh, as the groups to do all this. You know, there's some other things where, you know, there's tax differences between LCC and Greenville, for example, that we know of. You know, we're, it's easier for us to raise money because we're tax deductible. You know, so that's a, a difference, you know, that, and there are strategic things we can do too. You know, it was incredibly useful during the Laguna Canyon negotiations to have multiple organizations involved. Uh, and particularly when those organizations came at it from slightly different viewpoints. 
Now, clearly during those negotiations, the LCC was taking a much harder line than a Laguna Greenbelt was. And it worked to our benefit. In fact, if anybody, Gene left. Uh, Gene has a nice video of a panel discussion that was done about four years ago uh, with the, some of the key people in the Laguna Canyon purchase uh, negotiations on what went on behind the scenes. So if anybody wants to look at those, it's, it's really an interesting process. So as that was done as part of, sponsored by the Historic Society of Laguna Beach. So That's true. About, you can ask Gene about that. So, okay. So let's see some other questions. Of course, our concern is Laguna Canyon and open space primarily, which ties in to your concerns, but we have some other issues we really worry about. For example, the city's policy to underground utilities along Laguna Canyon Road and Coast Highway. Those are the evacuation routes in case of an emergency. Are there environmental concerns for them to do this, do you think? There can be. If they're gonna go, I mean, originally some of the plans can involve which side you bury the utilities on and how that impacts, again, the open space. Burying the utilities is not that simple. You know, and if you're gonna bury them all on the west side of the canyon, depending on how you do it, you're obviously disrupting the open space. Can it be done properly? Yeah, but again, you know, a couple of years ago, there was this effort to put in a pathway from Act 5 uh, to Elkhead. And the whole thing fell apart because of lighting. You know, they refused to put in enough down lighting that it wouldn't scare off the animals. Uh, but they were concerned that it had to be bright enough so somebody wouldn't trip. And so the thing collapsed for that reason. So it's details. It how is it going to work? You know, well, do you think the city my, thing, should... my thing is, I, I wish we'd look into taking the city off the grid. Altogether. You, oh, you mean going solar? Yeah. Yeah. For the amount, for the amount it costs to bury uh, all the utilities, you could solar panel half the city. So along those lines, would you be pro or con the city taking over Laguna Canyon Road from Caltrans then? Depends who's running the city. <laughs> who's running the city? You mean council or, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or yeah. staff? Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. Certainly. It, it just means people have to be involved. So, I mean, involvement. if the advantage that's being used is one of it gives us more flexibility in doing some types of plannings and other beautification projects. Um, and it depends, you know, I don't know how much Caltrans is gonna pay us to do it and all that. But right now it's hard to say, you know, it's, it'd be interesting to see at one time there was should have been a document saying what are the advantages and disadvantages. And I'm not sure that was ever done. But we have a council person here who would know that maybe. We often invite the council members to comment, but. <laughs> so Norm, ask that question again. When, when council said we we're gonna take over the Guna Canyon Road from Caltrans, was there a document that laid out the positives and negatives of, that, of making that decision? All, all I know is whenever we talk about taking over the road, be it the Coast Highway or Laguna Canyon Road, it all comes down to liability because both yeah. of them are very dangerous. And uh, so we have dodged that, but I should uh, double check that because, but I don't think that was done. Ask Lisa Bartlett that question next time. Lisa has some very good answers on taking over from Caltrans. Well, Lisa Bartlett said at a meeting that her dream would be to have Laguna Canyon four lanes wide with a, a 
place in the middle for the, for public transit. That's that's the um, and and I think your soon to be gone city manager agreed with that. Yeah, uh, can I comment here? Says that. I think it's 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 ridiculous to do that because you're always trying to reach an endpoint at Broadway or Coast Highway and Broadway. So there's no there's no added value there to bringing in more tourists faster because they'll just back up. Regarding Coast Highway and uh, Laguna Canyon Road, I just like to say that I think we need to take those over so we can control the future of Laguna Beach. There's no other way you can control the you know the speed limit, noise. Um, even going to congestion, a congestion tax for tourists entering this town, which I think we'll have to eventually go to with the kind of expectation of 12 million visitors in, in the future. Uh, you're gonna have to charge them for coming into our town because of the impacts. And that's one way of doing it. I, I haven't figured all that out, but that's the way of controlling our destiny. We have the money. Thank you. And I, I think we have, don't we have the liability no matter what? <laughs> I mean, well, of course, the liability is, is a term used for out of an abundance of caution. We can't do it. Right. That's all. It's an excuse. That's all. Let's face it. It's just, well, it's like we're taking over the beaches, you know, that we, we well, have the well when, 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 uh, when, when uh, I think uh, Corona Del Mar took over Coast Highway, they got 3.5 million from. Caltrans, you can negotiate them out again. I certainly wouldn't take it over before they do the improvements to South Laguna, but at some point, and a point has done it as well. Uh, are they bankrupt as a result? Is Corona Del Mar bankrupt as a result of taking out Coast Highway? I don't think so. Does anyone know when those uh, concrete barriers of Caltrans in the center of the road on the way out to Irvine are going away? Is anyone? heard anything about that? No. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, look at a different question. Okay. The fire department has a target species list, which includes 60 species that may not be planted. And if existing must be removed, however, 23 of which are on the landscape and scenic highway elements list of recommended species, including eucalyptus, cypress, pine, cedar, palm, that the elements seeks to preserve. Do we, does anyone know if the fire department target species list is science-based? If it's what? Tar if it's science-based, if they have done, I guess, scientific studies or analyses that tell them which species should be preserved? It's not, this is the fire department's target species. Not it's not a green validation. Okay, thank you. That's all you have to say. <laughs> oh, we have Johanna Felder wishing to comment. Go ahead. The is that to your question? It is not science based, according to Anne Crystal. Okay, that's great. So, all right, well, let me ask a question then about more Greenbelt for sure. The pinch points. One of the problems out at the pinch points on the wildlife corridor is the homeless trying to find shelter. Besides more fencing, are there uh, options, any other options for siting shelters reasonably nearby to tempt people away from the underpasses? and for apprehending and heavily you know charging the tigers we be, right before the pandemic last january we met with uh, several people in irvine including uh, the police commander in charge of that and uh, we recently had another meeting after a year uh, with the, uh, now a new person in charge. And Irvine has, and they will read you their list of why they are homeless friendly. And uh, they will take, they have, and they did manage to do some cleanup of that by having patrols. And they have a program in Irvine of trying to find housing for homeless. So uh, working with them also means working with Orange County uh, for the same reason. Uh, 
the problem, the problem with homeless is more at some of the smaller underpasses. The problem in the five freeway isn't homeless as much as taggers. I mean, they're bringing in generators. It is incredible to walk through that tunnel. It is 1,200 feet of actually a variation of graffiti and spectacular art. I mean, there's some really great stuff in there that you know people have done, and you know that requires. There have been some innovative ideas on that. You create a basically a graffiti park nearby where they can come and spray paint to their heart's delight, but uh, that's one that just is going to require patrolling and uh, more, probably some additional lighting for the animals and fencing, but it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard to keep those people out. Well, and that, and, you know, apprehending and charging the taggers, that's a police issue really too. Yes, it is, so, you have to catch them. Yeah, it's not- well, That means, that means increasing controls. Yeah. Things like that, yes. Gail, uh, Councilwoman Eisman has her hand raised. Yes. Okay. Hello. Um, I was on a Zoom call uh, with Katrina Foley, who uh, is now a board of supervisor. And one of the things she asked was uh, whether it would be a good idea when they were they're redoing boundaries for her to take Laguna, which I, I thought was a good idea. I didn't know if it, a good for her, good for us. But the other thing is that, that they have so much money. They have, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's Fort Knox there. And so there are all kinds of opportunities and, and she's looking for staff if you know somebody that you think would be good. But I think she'd be more than happy to help us with things. And, and she said that of the supervisors, Lisa Bartlett is the friendliest and most helpful one there. So that's kind of uh, uh, maybe we can count to two on some of the things that we want. We we are planning on meeting with her once she gets settled in. I would just like to mention that the OC Parks Commission uh, doesn't seem very <coughs> wilderness wilderness park friendly. So if the new supervisor has a OC Park Commissioner to appoint, that would be a plus. So we all heard about John Petick saying they won't take any more open space land from us to maintain. I mean, that's a big issue, isn't it? For us to talk to the supervisors about. Mm -hmm. Ask your speaker next month. Yes, we all better be here. So, all right, well, is there anyone else who wants to make a comment or a question? I think, you know, Norm, you've done a great job and and in the Laguna Greenbelt is lucky to have you. And um, you're working so hard on the wildlife corridor, I know. Um, I'm sure you have other concerns and issues coming up. I know you really do play a part in keeping an eye on Laguna and I, I appreciate it. So um, I just wanna say, is there anyone, one last time, if there's a question for Norm, then uh, now's the time, you know, the time. Otherwise, I just want to- I have a comment. Okay. It, it's Harry Huggins. Hi, Harry. I wanted to, I wanted to explain uh, a little bit of the inside that I know of for the city and the county not being willing to take over the open space management as they have in the past. The county is resisting because the city added on to that uh, responsibility that the county also be responsible for any land movement. And the county perceives itself as maintaining the surface and the sports activity, if you will, the maintenance of the activity. But if the mountain moves, <laughs> the county doesn't want to pick up that dollar uh, for what it may cost to uh, fix something else up. Uh, that's been the stumbling block for the last 10, 15 years. But to add oh, to what Harry said, 
most of what the land we're talking about was bought with Prop 12 funds through the Coastal Conservancy. And the county yeah. board of supervisors sent a letter to the Coastal Conservancy saying they would accept the management of the land through the lease with leases with Laguna Woods and the city and Laguna Beach. So yeah, it's it's a bad situation right now and something that really does need to be addressed. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I want to be sure. I want to be sure I understood Mary correctly. Mary, did you say that at that time that we accepted the land, uh, the county said they would take over all land movement as well, geotechnical and and no. those things? No, of course not. Good. They just agreed no. to manage the land. They agreed oh, good. to fund the surface. Manage the land. The surface of the land. Yes, okay, so that, we're on the same page. Matter. that detail wasn't part of it. Thank you. Okay, so really it is wonderful having so many people here tonight with a lot of knowledge and a lot of contributions to make. Thank you all. Thank you, Norman, for spearheading this discussion of so many different things, but I do think if we could all look forward to working together more in the future, we could do you know, some very important things we need to protect and maintain what we've all started back in 1989. <laughs> so, okay, so just a reminder that next month, May 3rd, Monday is Lisa Bartlett from the Orange County Supervisors. So we'll have a lot of good questions for her. And please, if you haven't renewed your membership for this year, do so for LCC so that you will be able to vote for new board members in May. We're looking for people to volunteer, nominate someone who's willing to serve. And it's uh, also, you'll be seeing emails regarding that. And then this program will be posted on the website within a few days if you <laughs> wanna see it again. And uh, with anything else, I will move to close the meeting otherwise. Great and thank job. You thank you all yeah, for being great job, here. Dale. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, George. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Okay. Hi, Ed. Hey, Jeff, are you there? Unmute yourself, say hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Jeff, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How, how's your oak tree doing? Well, uh, Johanna is pleased. Uh, we think we've got a bunch of new growth. We're not it sure, looked like it. We, we, we think so. I'll take another picture. Yeah, it's a it long time like we didn't lose the son of a gun. I, yeah, I don't think you will. I was being really cautious with the water recommendations, but I think you could um, increase that. Just keep an eye on it. Um, it's because, you know, those oaks don't typically grow on ridgelines like where you are, but you are protected you know, from the wind and the sun with the houses. So it does kind of act like a canyon experience for those guys. Uh -huh. uh, but it's, I, I, it's, it's done pretty well. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, the last picture you, 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 you shot, it looked like it got some new growth going. Yeah. So uh, we're watching your Facebook page and your wedding from uh, whenever it was 20 years ago. Uh -uh. Uh, as a matter of fact, what, what is the, the people who own your home now? They, they were in the local paper here with your house. Steve uh, Toes, uh, uh, something like that. Yeah. And uh, Sheila, uh, whoever owned, owns your new house. Right. So it was, it was fun, to, uh, fun to see that. Uh, 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 I've got, you know, the Canyon uh, Association and Neighborhood uh, Associations. I've been in that house uh, for a, a, a meeting, not during COVID. <laughs> but uh, uh, more than a year ago. So um, anyway, it was great to see you pop into our meeting here. Thanks very much. Well, I keep on, on 
tabs with the green belt too, and it sounded like a very interesting meeting to. But that to Norman is a pretty smart guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's good. But it's uh, you know, the uh, I, oh, you weren't here in the beginning. You know, Elizabeth Brown is in a uh, residential house home now. Ah, uh, not surprised. So, yeah. So she uh, uh, at at the uh, a year ago, uh, she looked very frail. Right. At the uh, Laguna Greenbelt meeting, uh, so she uh, she has help, and um, and um, so what what were we told? Uh, I think tomorrow is Elizabeth's birthday. Oh wow! So she's at she's living in Aliso Viejo by herself. Oh my God! Uh, wow! Uh, wow! Uh, uh, Greg Benford apparently has. Uh, 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 you know, has her there uh, with the care that she needs, and um, so you know, uh, just having brains doesn't do it. <laughs> she's as smart as you need, right? But uh, 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 at the beginning of the meeting, we gave people the address, uh, the email address, if uh, people wanted to say hi to her on her birthday tomorrow. Oh, nice. Yeah. So uh, we have and a so doozy. Where do I find that? Where do I find that link? Well, I'm, I'm your man. I'm your man. By the way, one of the things we have here uh, that uh, they did in the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park, uh, Laura Cohen did a, a bunch of um, uh, videos of people who uh, work to save uh save the the land for the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park. Right. And uh, has a whole series of videos of, of various people, Elizabeth Brown, Mary Fagris, so forth. Nice. And uh, Johanna and I were interviewed as a tag team, uh, which didn't go, all, didn't go all that great because she kept on interrupting me. And um, <laughs> uh, let's see, that's... I'm looking for Elizabeth Brown here. Okay, I've got it. So, um, uh, so two different things. You got a pen and paper? Yeah, let me get one. Okay, I'll sit here and talk to myself. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to a proposition that all men are created equal. All right, I'm ready. We're here today on a battlefield testing whether that nation. So Elizabeth Brown lives at Belmont Village, 300 Freedom Lane, apartment 224. Wait, uh, Belmont Village, what is it, Lane? Belmont Village. Right. 300 Freedom Lane. Freedom Lane, okay. Apartment 224. Uh-huh. Aliso Viejo. Uh huh. California 92656. Okay, great. Thanks, Jane. And her, her, uh, uh, I see some uh, influence by Greg because her email is now embenford at gmail.com. Okay. E is in Elizabeth, M is right. in Mary, Benford is in Bedford at gmail.com. Sweet. So, well well, uh, I will send her a happy birthday. Let me get back in the light here. There we go. So if you go to the, um, I don't know where you go. V, D, E, O. The thing that uh, uh, in, if you go listen to Johanna in my interview about the uh, uh, uh saving the land for the green belt for the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park, we oh. mentioned you. And we mentioned you for a couple of different things. One, sucking us in <laughs> to, these, to these things, uh, you know, getting Johanna onto the, um, uh, the um, uh, green belt board. Let's see if I can find this thing. Now, you know, I got a link from you several months ago. It was a message. And it looked like it came from you, but I've gotten... Um... Uh, I, I was hacked, so that was a good idea to ignore it. 
Yeah, I think it looked like it could have been a hack. So, well, what's your email address? I'll send you one tomorrow with with the links to the this thing. Sure, it's Jeff J E F F at C L I for Coastal Landscaping Inc. So it's Jeff at C L I then Landscaping dot com. Jeff at C L I Landscaping dot com. Jeff at C L I Landscaping dot com. So the thing that I remembered to say, and they get a series like 15 interviews. I, I mentioned Prop 70 in 1988. Yes. Now, of course, what I said may not be accurate, but what the hell? Anyway, I said, so what they managed to do was make a deal with the, uh, uh, let's see, who, who sponsored that uh, California environmental bond measure? Uh, mm -hmm. Conserva mm -hmm. Conservation League. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's the Conservation League on the video. And I said they negotiated that if they got enough signatures, that they would get a line item for $10 million to expand the Laguna Greenbelt. And one man managed to get 2,000 signatures by himself, Jeff Powers. <laughs> So say it's not true, go with it because it's now recorded. Is that true? Who would know? I, you know, is it not true? But I don't know. Well, you you were quite passionate about the whole thing and worked your butt well, off. Well, right? I'm always passionate, so that's yeah. you know my strength and my weakness. So um, the uh, 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 anyway, so uh, we mentioned you a couple times. I think Elizabeth in her interview mentions you oh. uh, not uh, most of the other uh, people i don't even know the other people some of this it's it's kind of interesting in saving the land to create the uh, park to create the land some people right. you don't you don't know their contributions and, yes uh, and right and it's kind of interesting to uh uh, uh johanna and i have uh, during covid we've been having cocktails at 5 30 and uh, so we went through all of them and watched them. And of course, we watched our interview twice. <laughs> yeah. That sounds fun. Well, if you could send me a link, that would be that would be really um, uh, enjoyable. Good times. I'll send it off. And um, thank you for liking my uh, granddaughter. Oh well, who who wouldn't? Are you kidding? She is a cutie. Oh my she god, is a cutie. She's beautiful. Okay. And you know how it all started with us too, is Johanna wanted two pots for her front door and asked me what I would recommend. Well, we, we do have quite a story uh, talking about how uh, 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 John Clark uh, uh, and uh, what was it? Uh, well, who's Pitsenberger? Oh yes, right, right. Uh, Gary Pitsenberger. Yeah, Gary. Gary. Yeah. Jeff loved our house, and John loved our house and had ideas, and John loved our house and had ideas. Gary loved our house and I had ideas and so forth. And uh, so, um, uh, yeah, I, I have a uh, uh, hundred times taken people out to my driveway. And I said, our front door, our, our, our walk to our front door was just 12 feet straight in. And our <laughs> landscape architect said, wouldn't it be more interesting to have a 35 foot walkway and we have drama and we have suspense and we have beauty as you go to the front door. Not to we mention some that. <laughs> I said, I, I don't have any friends who would appreciate any of that, but it does sound pretty good. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I believe you told us that. I think I heard the 2000 signatures um, but thanks to you, we have a mess up here in top of the world. You know, the, the uh, uh, three of the uh, ten million dollars from Prop Seventy they spent to buy the Karma Sandling property. Right. right. Four hundred and seventy-one acres for four million dollars. Figure what could go wrong, and um, and and so what we have right now uh, on Laguna Canyon Road at uh, they open up the um, the uh, park parking lots at eight o'clock, and at eight ten they're full. Wow! And uh, up here on Alta Laguna Boulevard, in the Alta Laguna Park, uh, 
they, uh, uh, you know, at eight 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 thirty in the morning, the entire uh, park parking lot and the entire um, it doesn't come to Park Avenue, but all the way say to Park right. Place on the street is full, and the yeah, mountain been, bikers and the hikers. All the and, yep. And it's uh, so they 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 say uh, the tourists, the uh, social media, they have found us. It's free parking, and uh, uh, it it is uh, it's something. It is. Uh, yeah, that's what I've been reading. And there's no restroom facilities, or well, at, at least Alta Laguna Park uh, has, right. has has a bathroom, um, but there's no ranger. Mm -hmm. No ranger. Well, I'm taking enough of your time. Uh, no, it's, it's nice. It's really good to I, I saw you pop in there. And I, I didn't want you to pop in and pop out without saying hi. Well, I didn't know you were on, but I sure enjoyed the talk. It was very interesting. I, I'm the Zoom master here. I'm in charge. I, I gotcha. Yeah. So I came in a little late. Uh, Melinda and I had late dinner, so um, I, miss, I missed the first little 20 minutes or so, but. Well, we, we miss you and we're in big trouble down here. So come back. <laughs> All right. Now we got, we got a good core of people. And of course, Norm is great. Uh, but when you lose Elizabeth Brown and you yeah. know, Carolyn Wood died a year right. or so ago. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I, uh, maybe you popped in after, but at some point Norm mentioned, is anybody here at the meeting under 50 years old? <laughs> You know. Oh wow, that's sad. So uh, it's uh, that's sad. Well, the fifty-year-olds are raising children and uh, have to make a living. Right. I'm retired. <laughs> so uh, just have your. Of course, I got to go get a replacement knee operation, but I'm retired. Oh, you're going to do that—a full one? They're going to cut it off and put put a metal one in, or what? I hope they don't explain it that way because that doesn't sound very appealing. No, it doesn't. I think uh, just a little, little uh, three-inch incision and do a little something, and uh, oh yeah, th that uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, yeah. But, I had um, years ago. It's not too bad. You had one. Yeah, yeah. No, not, I, not I think I, I'm I'm bone on bone. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, the odd thing is, uh, it is an excruciating pain but it is tight. Yeah. So uh, I, I'll go to bed and my, my, my leg will be out and I'll wake up and my leg is like this. Right. And to get it straightened is a dickens. Yeah. You know? Well, my course, I've got to get up and go pee. I hobble to the bathroom, you know. That's not safe. But my leg never has gotten the, the range back, you know. Uh -huh. It's a little bit... Even though I do a lot of hiking like you do, it's still not um, as good going up and down the hills, you know. Yes, yeah, so that, that's kind of the odd thing is that uh, 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 at least three or four or five people on the walking group have replacement hips or replacement knees. Uh -huh. They say, what the hell are you doing? Go get it done. Well, I'm here on Wednesday and every Wednesday morning and every Friday morning walking three or four miles with you. So right. I can't exactly go to the doctor or go to the insurance company and say, you know, I'm incapacitated, you know, uh, but, but uh, the, actually my biggest problem is sleeping. Yeah, right. I'd like to get a goddamn good night's sleep sometime here. So anyway, uh, I was your treasurer for a city council election. I'm sorry we failed there. Well, I try. I think we finally did close that account. You did. you did, yeah. Thank you for that, Gene. Thank you for that. Well, I miss you guys and 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 uh, say hello to Johanna for me. Give her a big hug for me. And uh, well, we I got don't... our shot, so I can do that. <laughs> so I don't know if I'll make it down that way. I just um, I just I just really have fallen in love with living up here. So. Um, it's hard. It's hard to imagine. Oh, to the photos you post. Uh, it's a, it's alluring. It's alluring. That's good. So I know Verna wants me to come down. She's got a little uh, guest house underneath that she's 
wanting Melinda and I to come down. So maybe when things settle down with the virus, we'll we'll, we'll do that trip. I don't know. We'll look forward to it. Yeah, and we got we got and a tour for a restaurant. That's right. What a concept. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for coming to the meeting. All right, Gene. Thanks for catching me before I got off. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.